in Washington State. Uh, my name is Andrea Botezato. I am Assistant Professor and Enology Extension Specialist with Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. And I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar, part of the Enology webinar series. Before I introduce our presenter today, I would like to cover a little, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this presentation will take about 45 to 50 minutes. There will be 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So I'm asking you to please hold your questions until the end. Um, and if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A uh, box on your screen there or in the chat box. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar and um, if you can take one minute of your time to fill out that survey and give me some feedback um, on the webinar on uh, what other topics you would like covered in this series, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and now let me introduce the presenter today. Um, he is Dr. Jim Harbertson from Washington State University. Dr. Harbertson is an Associate Professor of Enology at Washington State's Wine Science Center in Richland, Washington. He received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and doctorate in agricultural chemistry from the University of California at Davis. Jim's research focuses on the phenolic compounds found in grapes and wine and their biochemical and chemical changes during grape ripening, winemaking, and aging. Jim serves as an associate editor for the Australian Journal of Grape and Wine Research, and he is an active volunteer for the American Society of Enology and Viticulture, serving in various capacities on the board. He also serves as the technical program director and immediate past president. Dr. Harbertson has organized symposiums, workshops, and seminars in California and Washington. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harbertson, for being here today with us. Uh, and without further ado, I um, give the microphone to you. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate it. Um, and thanks for everybody for showing up. There's a lot of attendees, 42. Um, first, I have to apologize for what I did the last attempt to do because well, my wife and I recorded, she gave birth to a third boy and for us. And so uh, I'm a little bit busy at the moment, a little bit tricky. Trying to make uh, all the things happen at normal time, which we normally do. So, this time we have it together, though. So, the presentation I have for you today is, uh, as Andrew said, it's about phenolics in winemaking. Um, I have this nice title slide here. This is a picture in Washington State. And hopefully, some of you have been to Washington. Um, I think we actually probably share a lot of similarities in terms of the the air and climate and uh, the heat that we uh, get in Washington, and maybe even sometimes the snow during the winters, uh, although I don't think we're as extreme as what you see in Texas. So, um, I'm on the next slide. So, uh, just an outline of what we're going to go over today. Um, talk a little bit about phenolics, just about what they are, what's going on. And then, really, we're going to get at the, the main ones that I think are of, of interest here. And I'm, I'm going to try to avoid uh, a lot of the the so-called uh, you know, chicken wire with a lot of structures, as I don't know how beneficial that is because to those of you who are just trying to figure out how this all works. And we're going to talk about sort of the extraction process. And some of it's going to be a little more complicated, and hopefully some of it's a little more straightforward. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the formation of uh, wine pigments, these polymer pigments uh, as wine is made. And then we're going to get into winemaking techniques of kind of putting them into sort of a couple categories, the more tan and the less tan, if you will. And you kind of, when, when you start to see uh, what's happening with the extraction process, you understand why I'm kind of going that route as opposed to talking about color instead. So um, in terms of what phenolics are, they are a heterogeneous class of molecules. They are all based on a phenolic ring, which is basically a benzene ring with a hydroxyl. I promised you a few structures, so I didn't really put that on here. But uh, this class of compounds has a lot of different uh, impacts on wine. I think the main one that people consider for specifically the red wine that makes it so uh, interesting is astringency, and that's a tactile sensation that's roughing and drying of your mouth after you've expectorated the wine or after you spit it out. 
out, and that's caused by tannins binding to the salivary proteins in your mouth. And essentially, when you spit into the spit bucket, you can see evidence of that. I don't know how many of you have ever done that. It's kind of gross, but it's kind of cool. I always feel like the people in the past that did like prophecies and whatever, and they would chop up eggs or you know maybe entrail to some poor goat. They, they should have just been spitting wine out and looking at the weird swirly things in the spit bucket because it makes some pretty cool things. Sorry, that's a bit gross. Anyways, so um, also for coloration and anthocyanins, those are the pigments that come in the fruit, and they are the main pigments that have that function in the wine as well. Of course, they're also for bitterness, and these are the small molecules, the amphiols, um, although it's not completely settled on exactly what causes bitterness in red and white wine, but we know that, that the phenolics, uh, these lab amphiols and tannins, have a slight bitter character to them, but mostly the, the lower molecular weight stuff. The tannins tend to be quite a bit bigger uh, in terms of their size, and they don't, they tend to come after the proteins instead, uh, going into little receptors on your tongue for bitterness, right? There's also uh, the idea that some of the compounds are kind of like sunscreen, if you will. They, uh, they are very planar molecules with flat holes, and they just basically act like sunscreen. They absorb UV light very easily, and when you have, uh, are in, you have a lot of vineyards that have a lot of UV absorbance, you'll tend to find a lot of these compounds made in the skin. Um, when they're bound with sugars, they're pretty soluble. As the wine's getting made, the sugar comes off, and these compounds become pretty insoluble, and they make weird strings of crystals at the bottom of your tank. In terms of all these things, these phenolics, they all participate sort of as antioxidants. Um, there's, a, there's a whole other class called non-flavonoids, like hydroxycinamides. They're, they're pretty small molecular compounds. They don't really they don't have any sensory character when they're bitter or give the wine color, but they do kind of provide a sort of general antioxidant, meaning that they'll react with or participate in oxidation reactions uh, instead of other molecules for you. Uh -oh. My, my microphone not working. I can I can hear you, and I believe um, most people can hear you. I think some are having trouble with the uh, sound. Um, okay. I'm, I'm Somebody just said I need to touch the blue phone button at the bottom of my screen. Not not you. I think uh, uh, the attendees need to touch that. It's not. I don't okay. believe Sorry. it's for you. No problem. Okay, just making sure. All right. So, anyways. Um, the more recently, the oxidation of phenolics is what they did. They did the role of both bisulfide or the sulfur dioxide and the catalysts, iron and copper, have kind of become more evident in the literature. It's, it's quite complicated, unfortunately. You can sort of sum it up really quickly is that phenolics tend to play a role in both pro oxidants and antioxidants in wine. And, uh, they do tend to do more good than bad, thankfully. <laughs> but that's another, that's a, that's a very long lecture in of itself. All right. All right, let's just get into extraction then. Let me just work this thing out. So I have this sort of cutaway plot here of the uh, fermentation. You can kind of see that uh, there's an extraction interface and there's a sort of gradient of color coming away from these sort of representations of berries being extracted at the top of the tank. And this is the structure. I promised to try to keep the, the chicken wire to a minimum, but I'm sorry. Here, here's one of the main pigments in wine grapes. This is uh, now a little and this compound, due to the fact that it has sugar and its partial charge on it, that's sort of delocalized around the grape structure, um, are extraordinarily water soluble. And they're found in the skins of the grapes. And they're very readily extractable. In fact, they're pretty much sort of extracted within the first three to four days um, due to this uh, being just in the skins and being extremely water soluble. Um, what makes these compounds sort of unique is that they have a lot of different properties about them. Firstly, they are susceptible to bleaching. So whenever you add just small amounts of um, sulfur dioxide and things of that nature to your wine for antimicrobial activities or try to stop oxidation from happening, you'll also bleach a little bit of the pigment as well. Um, and this, this form of it actually serves to be sort of a, a reservoir, if you will, for the catalyst or two uh, as you're making the wine. They kind of will release a little bit usually kind of matters most when you have very low SOP in your wine, so you can help protect it a little bit. The other interesting part about these compounds is they do something known as co-pigmentation. And this is where these compounds, they work for themselves. Actually, this is an equilibrium form of several of the different structures of this compound. And they'll interact with that one of the other equilibrium forms, uh, chalcone. And they'll also uh, interact with other non- other non-flavonoids and other flavonoids um, that, are, that are colorless. And in doing so, they'll give the wine or the, the solution that they're in more color than they would you'd expect to 
again, based on the measurement of the pigment itself. It gives you a deeper color, uh, a richer color, and, and more of it. Um, so when you see wines that are kind of blue and purple, this is largely, in fact, due to the fact that these things are copigmented and they are interacting with the pi bond orbitals that are kind of uh, coming out of the um, out of these nice electron dense ring structures on the rings. Okay. So uh, uh, the red wine tan extraction, this is sort of the other big class of these things that cause astringency, if you will. And these are, and are water, very water soluble. All these hydroxyls all over this molecule make it extremely water soluble. In fact, they, they are uh, made in grape cells, they're in vacuoles and things of that nature. So they're extremely water soluble. And as I said earlier, they will impart estrogen character to it. Now, um, they also will interact with the anthocyanins as the ones are made. These bonds are, are breakable uh, under acidic conditions. And they'll recombine with the anthocyanins and make a new set of compounds called polymeric pigments. Now, not all the polymeric pigments, of course, are tannins bound to these structures and any of the anthocyanins. Some of them are very small, some of them are, are just derivative anthocyanins. But for the most part, the ones that we're the most interested in are these tannins, if you will, uh, that are, uh, you know, big the pores have sort of softened the stringency as the wine gets made, and not like that, they also change the color of the wine. They make it more kind of brick orange. And as you see a, a nice young wine, it's kind of blue purple. Uh, an older wine is kind of more brick red. That's due to the formation of these pigments that change the way that the um, absorbent sets in that ring and you get a new color. These molecules are also a lot more uh, stable to sulfur dioxide bleaching. So, in some of the cases, the positions where the SO2 would necessarily interact with the molecule are blocked with covalent bonds to new to new part of the structure. So they just they, the SO2 can't get in and inter interact. And um, some of them um, they are not and they will bleach a little bit, but for the most part they're a lot more stable to SO2 bleaching than uh, the normal pigments would be. So now let's talk about kind of the big sort of the trouble with this extraction process. Um, and this is a slide that um, came from some work I did a few years ago now. Um, making wine from a bunch of different rootstocks, uh, rootstock combinations of Merlot and Syrah. So we had, I think, you know, five different rootstocks and unrooted it with Merlot and same with Syrah. And um, we made wine across for different years. People made the wine exactly the same way every year. We had the same yeast, the same heat profile and everything. And uh, this is a measure here um, of total food tannin. Again, this is measured in the same exact time period every time. Right? Okay. You, can you can see here that there really is a particularly great relationship between the food tannin and the wine tannin. It's almost like a uh, some sort of modern art piece or something like that. Uh, if you will, there really is. Uh, significant correlation between uh, the fruit and the wine tannins. And even if you are in trying to look at skin tannins or seed tannins or seed tannin by proxy, you can't really find any good relationship. And um, this is due to the fact that there's a lot of things that are interacting with tannins during the wine making process itself. Okay. So in, um, in vinifera, just why does vinifera produce? They eat cell walls and cell walls. Um, they will actually just bind um, complex and make big complexes with them. And the larger the tannin is, uh, the bigger, uh, the easier it is for it to participate in this interaction. And I think the easiest way to think of this, I have it here, is the sponge of these poly complex polysaccharides. You have to kind of satisfy that sponge before you get tannin into the wine. So uh, it's kind of this interesting, weird thing that, that that's sort of unique to grapes, and if you will. Um, if you're making a wine from French American hybrids, um, and I think that there is a little bit of French American hybrid uh, grapes in, in Texas, I know more so in, in New York, in, in Virginia, and et cetera. But those grapes um, have an even bigger problem in that they have also one of the, the, the proteins that are make those those grapes disease resistance, known as pathogenesis-related proteins, 
are constituently turned on in those grapes. And that means they're making those proteins to, to make sure that the, they don't eat the bananas. And um, those proteins will also bind tannins. In fact, you can refine an oil. I've actually had a student come out all the way from New York and work in my lab where we actually found one of those old wines and we, uh, we, we took a big concentrated solution of tannin and we put it in the wine and we precipitated out of the there in the wine, it was a, a one or two year old bottle of wine with just a whole lot of this protein left in there. And so you have not just the complex, you have not just this polysaccharide sponge in the hybrids, but you've also got this protein sponge. And that, that is in some way, a lot of times you can't even get uh, tannin into these uh, French American hybrid wines because you've got so much of this protein and also this polysaccharide component that actually just soaks up all of the tannin and also Meaning that if you try to add tannins out of bags and things like that when you buy from uh, Wallamong or Four or whatever, um, they also get bound to that protein. And so it's, it's, it's a real tricky uh, situation. And uh, I think people on the East Coast are still working on that problem, but they have not got it sorted as far as I understand. Now, uh, it's largely been known that alcohol has a little bit of influence on tannin extraction in wine, despite the fact that these molecules are really water soluble. We know that the, the alcohol will kind of influence the extraction. Mostly we think that it has um, ability to sort of alter the, the cell composition in the seed of the grape. So alcohol tends to help you extract more seed tannin into the wine, not so much skin tannin, but for sure the seed tannin by kind of helping the seed swell a little bit and having those cells burst as, uh, as you're making the wine. So you kind of extract some of those components out of there. But uh, interestingly enough, the whole extraction process that is in wine making is pretty is slow, and you actually get fairly different tannins than what's found in the skins and the seed. And the skins and the seed tannins themselves are pretty different from each other. The skin tannins are really big, and the seed tannins are really small. And um, when you look into the wine, you kind of find mostly small things, and this is due primarily to the fact that the the big tannins uh, they get stuck with all these polysaccharides and uh, proteins, and so mostly end up with a lot more of these small tannins than are, are in the wine, not so much the big ones. And uh, the reason that's relevant is that the big tannins are really, really astringent uh, when we look at their ability to bind precipitate proteins, which you can find in your saliva and other situations. Um, the larger the tannin is, the more efficient it is at, at precipitating the protein and being more astringent as well. So mostly what we end up in wine is more of the soft, the, the less astringent, smaller tannins that uh, are not really found in the skin of the grapes. All right. So here is um, actually a graph just sort of demonstrating this. Uh, this is a, just trying to look at like what tannins are getting extracted during winemaking and um, and how fast they do get extracted. And this was an experiment done on a really itty bitty scale, like three liter scale, and probably one of the worst grapes to do with this kind of uh, experiment, to be honest with you, Pinot Noir, because we all know that Pinot Noir has very little color and very little tannin. So um, we kind of, we wish we'd have a redo with cap or something like that, we could find something else. In any case, um, they, uh, they were able to use a floral glue analysis method technique to so depolymerize the tannins and then figure out what the subunits were so that way they could differentiate between the skin and the seed tannins during the extraction. What they found was that these skin tannins extracted pretty quickly. So within the first six days, they've extracted out here. And the seed tannins are a lot slower to plateau. So they're still going up here. They only did about 20 days of extraction here. And so what they suggested at the time was that if you do a longer maceration, that's going to favor seed extraction because you more or less plateaued out. What you see later on in terms of uh, when you do longer macerations, like extended macerations, things like that, we do tend to get a lot more tannin as a result of that. And I'll show you some good evidence of what, 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 that, what those tannins look like. So, um, for extraction, uh, I forgot I had an animation here, Andrea. Anyway, oh. never mind, it's okay. So, um, in this case, uh, we know that the extraction is limited for the tannins. We saw that earlier with that big horrible shotgun blast of the graph. And now we've got the uh, same plot of, for the same wines uh, for fruit anthocyanins versus wine anthocyanins, both on a, on a fresh weight basis and then on a concentration basis up here. This is closer to a concentration basis here instead of on a per bearing basis or with a fruit anthocyanin. So it should represent kind of what you get in the crush. And what you can see is that there's actually significant relationships um, for between the fruit and the wine color, but they're largely based upon uh, vintage and also based on 
cultivar. So it's not as straightforward as you would as hope. You kind of see there's some strange relationships going on here. Um, not quite the way you expect. So you know, four milligrams per gram fresh weight, and with um, these merlots are the open triangles, and in the season here, you're getting you know 800 milligrams per liter, and then over here in another season, the 2009, and almost double or triple the amount of concentration of fruit itself. You have a similar concentration in the wine, but way more fruit and the sign itself. So I guess what I'm getting at here is that it seems like it's straightforward, but it's not. And you think you, if you've gotten, you should have more fruit color, you should get more wine color, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Um, for a little while in Australia, they, the Australian industry attempted to try to give bonuses to growers uh, for having more fruit and assignment, and, and that way they could they could sort of give them a quality bonus. So that way, you know, extra money. You know, if you got better fruit, you got more color. Um, you get something for it. And uh, quickly, the wineries realized that this didn't always necessarily translate to more color in the wine. So they stopped that whole bonus thing, and they actually even stopped trying to mess around with fruit color versus wine color because they couldn't really make heads or tails of what was happening there. Um, as this is, you shouldn't try to figure that out, but it does sort of suggest that it, 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 you know, you couldn't get bonuses for it. People couldn't sort that out. Maybe it is worth looking into figuring out what's happening there. So in terms of the, again, we have none of these complex relationships. Um, we know that, uh, that there's a that co-pigmentation phenomenon. We think that there might be some influence of getting more color into the system with all these cofactors, and that might help or change the wine to a certain extent. There's also some people that think that some of these charged forms of the anthocyanin or even the non-charged forms may be actually just uh, absorbing to the polysaccharides a bit the way that the tans are, but not quite as strong a little interaction. But um, we don't really have an answer as to what's happening there yet. I think that um, Anita Oberholster at UC Davis is doing trying to do some work onto this right now. Um, we also know that alcohol doesn't influence any extraction, and that's because these things are extraordinarily water soluble. They come up hot, they come out in the first few days. Um, and on top of all this, in terms of this strange absorption, desorption phenomenon of things, we also have the fact that the anthocyanins are also interacting with tannins and other molecules and forming polymeric pigments, which again is going to throw off any attempts that you make for making a relationship between the fruit and the wine, because um, that sort of, depending on how hot or something was, you might get some errant results, which is why when I showed you the results earlier, we measured that color at the same time and the tannin at the same time, so that at least we had an idea that they were all kind of taken in the snapshot in a similar way, so that would be a negate any of those kind of effects. All right. So um, here is a graph showing kind of um, just the evolution of tans and anthocyanins in a, in a uh, commercial fermentation. And um, the open circles represent the anthocyanins and the closed circles represent the tannins. And you can see, as I said, the anthocyanins come out really, really quick. So this is a 10 ton scale fermenter um, done at uh, a red facility up here in Washington. Um, and you can see the peak is happening within the three three to four days, and then it drops down right after that. You kind of see it kind of levels off down here. And the tan extraction goes up and then levels off. And so it's kind of a, it's a, it's a combination of the two plots you saw earlier for the skin and sea tans themselves. So you make this sort of leveling out plot going up, 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 and then leveling off. And so after the tans are done being extracted, and this is about 20 days, we're doing a maceration trial in this case, I think actually it's 30 days. Um, this ends up being um, the when we pressed off, and you can really see that the tannin doesn't change a whole heck of a lot after that. And this facility, they measured everything every week for a long time, so we got samples every week, and we just measured it over and over and over and over again. And even though these were put in barrels and everything else, you don't really see a change in the tannin there, right? So there's not really a lot of tannin coming out of the barrels to influence this protein precipitation reaction that's going on here. But we are seeing this decline in the anthocyanins, and that's largely due to the fact that these two molecules are going to start interacting with each other, making a new set of things that are called that thing, all right? So here's a graph showing a little bit of polymer pigment development within the year. We've broken these out to be uh, based on this analysis I did work on a long time ago, but 
and the kind of arbitrary distinctions you call in small small polymer pigments. These are low molecular weight ones, ones that aren't tannins, and then large molecular large polymer pigments. These or hall high molecular weight ones is where you have the assign it down to a tannin. And what these show is that you get kind of slowly getting more formation of the SVP during the first 250 days, that's the first year, if you will. And the largest increase is happening within those, you know, first 30 to uh, days practically for SVP. And, and LPP is, is taking longer to form uh, as opposed to uh, the SVP. When you do different kinds of wine making techniques, you're also changing the kinds of tannins you're getting. In this case, when you're showing a graphic with uh, extended maceration, and you're seeing more large polymer pigment during the first 30 days, and then more, especially during the first 250 days, and then more over the 400 days compared to the control. And this is due to having more tannins in there and more of these polymers, and you're getting more opportunities to form these new kinds of compounds. So, um, the polymer pigment formation, as I said before, we, we need anthocyanins, we need tannins. There are other kinds of compounds that can form these kinds of polymers. You get, when you form acetaldehyde through aging of the wine and oxidizing alcohol, the acetaldehyde will also bridge between these types of polymers. Um, so which might, well, sometimes people want to do um, microoxygenation and things of that nature. They think that it changes the tannins and alters their stringency. There's some evidence that that may be the case, which is kind of cool. You can do that and have that kind of technique. In your pocket for sort of softening a wine. Um, there's also other small molecular weight molecules like pyruvate, which also will form a, a new types of polymer pigments. These are typically found in things like port, uh, where you arrest the fermentation and then you actually stop the yeast from consuming and using up all the pyruvate, which normally would be uh, utilized in things like the, the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, just pyruvate being pretty easy for the grape uh, for the yeast to metabolize, right? So one of the questions um, I wanted to ask in terms of uh, some experiments I've done recently is how long really does it take to split before we showed you um, that, you know, it takes about, you know, within the first two to 150 days to 400 days, we've got a lot of formation. But I wanted to know, well, how long does it take for it to really actually go all the way to finishing? And, um, and also, which is more important uh, in terms of forming polymer pigments? Is it the color? Is it the tannins? Which one is really influencing the formation of these polymer pigments? So if I was going to try to maximize the formation of polymer pigments, which would matter more in you know, tannins or anthocyanins? And there's also there was some there's some literature out there that suggests that there's kind of magical ratios between tannins and pigments that will help you maximize these pigments. Um, it will just tell you now dispel that myth. <laughs> it's just not true. But uh, we'll get into the data here in a second. So. This is a plot showing that we made wines from fruit that was unripe, and ripe and overripe. And we did this with a, different, a couple of different cultivars. We did it with Syrah, which has a lot of pigment in it and not so much tannin. We did it with Cabernet, which had a lot of pigment and a lot of tannin. And this is just a summary of all the plots uh, for both all the unripe and unripe and ripe wines. And with the overripe stuff, you can see pretty quickly that the anthocyanins decline rapidly. Now, this is done in an incubator, and we purify the, the tannins and the anthocyanins out of that system. Primarily because there's no way I can get a rat to see to stay on for years and years and years. Um, so we, we basically did it in an incubator and we found that about a month in that incubator represents pretty much what happens in about a year in the cellar. So that more or less is suggesting that within the first year to two years that most of your polymer pigment has been formed, as most of your anthocyanin is being uh, sort of is declining here. And these anthocyanins are either making polymer pigments or they're making bizarre set of compounds known as globophenes. Um, they can sort of break it down and they can show you found with all kinds of other uh, interesting sorts of things like tanned leather and things like that. They actually are breakdown products of these anthocyanins. But you can see that decline is pretty rapid. That's a natural law. That's an exponential decay. And it's a perfect fit for that exponential decay for the mathematics of it. Now, what happens with the polymer pigments? Sort of the same thing. So as the anthocyanins are declining, and within the first two months or two years, if you go on the cellar, you're getting most of the formation happening. In this case, you can see that um, we've got the unripe having the least, um, the ripe having a little bit more, and then in the case of the Syrah, uh, the overripe having the most, and the cab, it doesn't really differentiate the overripe versus the ripe. 
just the difference there in the fruit versus the wine. You can make heads or tails of it, but essentially you're just getting uh, more of this stuff being formed um, in the ripe and the overripe fruit when the you know, sinuses are a little bit higher in the fruit. Um, and so realistically, what this really points to is it, it's really about being able to sign. You can kind of see this is the this relationship here in the pig in the end sign is down by that time, by the second month, and you're maximizing the formation. This suggests, of course, the end signs are, are largely driving the polymorphic formation. And when you try to predict this out, of course, that's what you find. So just the initial concentration of the end sign is in the, the wine, really, this is a, taken at about um, for the fifth day when you have the big maximum peak there. Is really what helps to predict the the formation. That's the highest. That's a pretty good correlation there. Although I mean, we drew a line to make it show it's kind of linear. I wouldn't say that it's most linear relationship, but it's definitely um, a, a good correlation between them. And, and it's mostly the pigments that are really predicting this. Now, of course, we looked at the other factors like the relationship, this ratio. We can see that it's not a good correlation for either the Syrah or the Cannon. But with Cannon and Syrah, uh, not so great. When you have the sign is much better, but when you add them together, it's going to have the best relationship. And for the cab, which has lots of tannin to begin with, it doesn't have a good relationship. But when you put in a plus, it's a little bit better. Um, so it does it does say that tannin has a role, and it mostly has a role in situations where you don't have a lot of tannin, like in Syrah, whereas in cab, because you have lots and lots of tannin to begin with, it's less important. Okay. So in other scenarios, you can imagine like Pinot Noir, which I attempted to study, but no one in Washington would let me study it because it's not an important grape here, but I wanted to study it because it has very low tannin and very low color. It would have given us an idea about when you have the situation being very, very low pigment and low tannin, which would be the, the sort of winner. And I still think it ends up being the uh, science and the tannin may play a bigger role though in that case, where it's probably the, the, the two of them added together gives you the, the best correlation, mostly for the Pinot Noir. So clearly the most important role is the antisinans, and this means in terms of what we can do in the vineyard from a practical standpoint is that, as we said before, cultivar plays a huge role in how much pigment you get in fruit, probably how much we get in the wine to a certain extent. Environmental factors in terms of growing those grapes will also play a role in that. So if you're doing deficit irrigation, leaf pulling, um, all these kinds of things can all sort of have an effect on how much antisinans you get in the fruit. Um, so when you can manage that portion of it pretty easily, um, so we kind of know that these cultivars are specific, but we don't really understand why there's these different ratios between them. Um, so we also, so clearly we all know that vineyard management is going to be the first place probably and the best place to sort of manage, uh, color formation in, in terms of, uh, the fruit and how much you get in the wine, but we don't really know to what extent how winemaking has an effect. We'll try to get into that, at that in these next few slides about doing things in the wine that would alter extraction of these phenols. So in terms of techniques um, for more tannin, we know that uh, sort of the generality, if you increase the temperature of your ferment, you tend to get more tannin. Now granted, 90 degrees Fahrenheit is probably not a good temperature to get to ever in your winery because that's the temperature where yeast tend to die in your ferment. So you may stick a ferment if you try to heat it up too much, but you can definitely increase the uh, effectiveness of the extraction by getting it up to 85 degrees Fahrenheit in your fermentation. We also know that it's really good uh, if you use extended maceration. Longer maceration periods will give you uh, more tannin in the wine. Another one uh, that we'll go through quite a bit today is called pre juice, uh, pre fermentation juice removal, otherwise known as sommelier, where you, you're crushing the fruit initially on the first day and then bleeding a portion off and essentially concentrating the system. That does have an effect on tannin extraction more of it for sure. Enzyme additions as well. Uh, some of these enzymes will break down some of these uh, cells and allow you to extract a bit more tannin. The, the stuff that's not very effective are things like doing changing your mixing regimes like punch downs and pump overs. They're kind of they're sort of effective but not extraordinarily effective in terms of managing how much tannin you get in there. And of course way down here at the bottom and I, I, I hope that the doesn't really get too upset about this, but it's that if you're adding tannins out of bags um, that you purchase and things of that nature, these don't aren't very effective at adding more tannin to the wine. These are really 
lousy, to be honest with you, in the case of getting more cannabis, they will alter the wine flavor oftentimes in the aroma due to the fact that they have oak compounds in there and things that smell like oak flavors and things of that nature. But there really isn't a whole lot of tannin in many of these uh, situations that are in these extracts. So if you want to lower the tannin, of course, um, you could lower the temperature. That's a good way of doing it. But we know that if you increase the temperature, you get more total phenolics as well as tannins. Um, you don't really change the extraction of the pigments themselves. They're not affected by heat. Uh, you do get more of the formation of polymeric pigments. In fact, you can kind of see, you can track, right? When you change the temperature, and you'll see a formation that kind of goes up like a line from that point forward with, uh, in terms of the formation of polymeric pigments. Pigments if you track it pretty nicely. Uh, cold soak, um, we know it does do a temporary increase in anthocyanins, but it doesn't uh, affect tan extraction, it doesn't help it. If you go really, really crazy and buy a bunch of dry ice and things of that nature, you can you can um, freeze thaw your system by actually cracking those cells open by actually just freezing it solid. And then as they as you those cells expand, they'll, they'll grow burst open and then you extract all the contents, right? That works very effectively. It's extremely expensive. And most of the time when I've heard people talk about it, it changes the wine so dramatically that they, they're not, they're no longer as typical of being what you expect to get from that kind of grape, where even some of the flavor components are changed pretty dramatically as well. Remember, not just tannins and anthocyanins are found in those cells, but it's also the aroma and flavor compounds. So you do have to be careful when you go to the extreme of freezing and thawing and cracking cells. It's extremely effective, too effective. Uh, okay, so extended maceration. So this is one that we've, I've probably studied the most personally, and this is where you're trying to get a longer period of time. We've said earlier of seed contact after the um, start of the wine making process. So um, you tend to get a lot more seed tannin content in the wine, which increases both bitterness and astringency because you're extracting uh, more of the loam-like and the of compounds that are found in seed. So it changes both the amount and the size of the tannin. We'll give you, I'll show you a slide here in a second about what that looks like. And as you saw earlier, you'll also get a lot more polymer pigment. And you get that loss of signs due to the fact that you've got more of the polymer being formed. And you tend to get more of a brick red sort of form in the wine. You've got to be careful with oxidation when you're doing a sediment menstruation. You've got to use heavy inert gases like carbon dioxide or argon, things of that nature, to make sure that you don't oxidize, especially if you're trying to do things on a small scale. Larger scale, it's not an issue, but small scale. So here's a slide showing you uh, the impact of extended maceration on tannin polymer distribution. So a student of mine uh, who graduated a few years ago, we did um, uh, this sort of combination experiment looking at depth segregation, extended maceration, and things, and trying to figure out what controls tannin extraction more, winemaking or or vineyard stuff, and we found that winemaking was the most important. And he, he went to this painstaking exercise of actually fractionating all the tannins on these big columns, and then looking at these fractions and depolymerizing them and looking at what the size of these tannin polymers were that were in the wines. You kind of see here that we separated away the monomers here and then the, the polymers. So you can see the mean degree of polymerization. It's not the best way of measuring polymer sizes. It's not that good at the moment, but it's the best we've got right now in terms of chemistry. You can see pretty dramatically between this control, it's on the same scale, way more dimers, so a lot more low molecular weight technique uh, or compounds on the extended maceration. And there's more trimer, more tetramer, more pentamer, hexamer, heptamer, octamer, nonamer, tenamer, lemonamer, sorry. I, I can never remember that once the names of the past nine. Anyways, you get more of these tannins in a lot of different distribution. You can see in these other ones, you're sort of seeing these large molecules there. And there, there's not really any of them here. And that really suggests that as you're soaking it there, some of these really big tannins start to get stuck, probably to polysaccharide or anything else you're leaving in uh, the grape skins and things of that nature in the ferment that you're doing so. So, um, yeah, this is a pretty nice demonstration of this. And just so I left, I have the, the data about the wine, just so you kind of see the basic information about what wine we were making. So, so this came from Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's you know pretty standard PHDA here for Washington. 14% alcohol, pH 3.8 when it's finished, and about 5.7 grams per liter of titratable acidity. So um, a pretty big wine. This is from a vineyard that is pretty highly prized. So we got to work in a nice vineyard for this experiment. So. This is uh, coming from good fruit, not sometimes that we get that donated to us and some stuff that nobody really wants. This is nice fruit. Okay. 
So we also did descriptive analysis of that of those wines, and I have it sort of blocked out here in terms of the right hand side of this uh, principal component analysis and um, and the controls on the other side. And I just want to show you that when you do the extended maceration, you get more bitterness, more stringency, and because we're making these wines on a small scale, you get a bit more oxidized character in them, a little bit more brown, and have that component from the color change. So it's a pretty dramatic effect, um, moving away from the the saturated color components and the, the red fruit and black fruit. So extended maturation is a very powerful technique. Um, not all the S elements here are necessarily what you want. Maybe you could try doing do your wines with extended maturation to see if you like it and then blending it back into other stuff that's not done with extended maturation to see what you think of it. All right, so pre-fermentation runoff. This is another big important one uh, where you're bleeding off some juice beforehand to try to sort of increase the skin to see uh, and to juice ratio. This is essentially an attempt to simulate berry variation in size without changing the berry composition. So uh, if you will, we're trying to get a smaller berry without having to you know, alter things in the vineyard or whatever. Though mostly we found that you get phenolic enhancement in the extended color, tannin, polymer pigments. Sometimes you get varietal differences. A singleton, uh, Bruno Singleton, sort of the, one of the, the best researchers in this area way back in the 1970s, is really probably some of the best work that's been done on phenolics over the years. Um, he found this out way back in 1972. We followed up on Dr. Singleton's findings and looking at sort of, I would call it modern Sanye. And this is something that is kind of unique to places that are really warm, like California, Washington, and possibly even Texas. You guys might have some of these same sorts of similar situations. Where in these cases, we have a lot of really overripe fruit. We're picking really, really high bricks, 26 to 30 bricks. That's really, really um, high. And you tend to have to do water additions, which are illegal in America, to sort of make sure that you don't stick the ferment, because you're going to get more than 14, 15 percent alcohol, much higher than maybe you necessarily want. So uh, because we know that sugar accumulation is sort of, you know, stopping at a renal level before this happens, you're really getting that, that increase in sugar concentration due to dehydration. So if you add the water back, then you, then you would necessarily just dehydrate it out of the vineyard, um, sort of the, say just defeating the purpose of ripening it, right? So a lot of people have attempted to sort of go around this by bleeding off a portion of it first and then adding water back to lower the bricks so that way they can still maintain that that uh, increase in, in concentration that they got from dehydrating things out of the vineyard. And I know that's kind of complicated, but bear with me. Let me get some grass here. Okay, here we go, sorry. So here's a plot showing where you've done just that. You've added juice and you've added, uh, you've added Sanye about the same, at the same percentage of the water back. And you can see both the control, which is the, uh, the red dot here for tannins on the top one, and anthocyanins on the bottom one. And you can see for anthocyanins, yes, it makes a big difference initially, but over time that difference goes away. And you get a, few, get a bit more polymer pigment formation. And for the tannins, it's a little bit different and stayed that way for a while, but then over time, the differences are pretty small. Um, and this, of course, this experiment was done on a really, really big scale, on a 10 ton scale. And when you just do Sanye, where you bleed off a lot more. So in this case, I had to bleed off double the amount from the, the water addition, so that way we really could see a big effect from it. You can see the, the change here is quite dramatic. It's really a giant increase in tannins and a big increase in color. So essentially when you do these bleed offs and water backs at the same rate, the effect is more subtle. If you want to really get a big increase in color, you can sacrifice a lot more. And these days making a Sonia Rosé is very vogue. So you could actually do this and then make a really different kind of style of red wine here with a lot more tannins a lot more color uh, by doing it this way. In this case, we added an extended maceration to it. I'll just sort of, I'll just show you, this is the bleed off and the water back at the same rate, plus the extended maceration. This would be the, we would rather have separated this out, but the winemaking team there had actually decided that they really liked bleed off and water back to the point of being their basic winemaking protocol. 
and they refuse to include a control for these minimum maturation formats. But in any case, you can see with these minimum maturations, we get a lot more tan extraction. And then, of course, the pigments are higher in the control versus the extended maturation due to the fact that you're forming more polymeric pigments in those minimum maturations. Okay. 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 Okay.
most effective strategy for um, places like Texas, where we do have issues with tannin accumulation and and long term uh, as wines age, what can we expect um, with in in terms of color? Um, well, I, 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 I have to look at the uh, some examples of the wine to see where the issues are, but you know, um, it, you pretty much you have to kind of start in the vineyard for what you're doing in terms of color development. I think that's pretty much the easiest place to start um, trying to fix some of those things. But I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't know how much French American hybrid that you guys are working with there, and how much of it's actually vinifera. Well, we have quite quite a lot of vinifera actually. We have two okay. two big hybrids that we work with, but for the most part, it's vinifera. Yeah. Well, perfect. That makes it a lot easier then. So I would just go down that road. If you want to make wines that are more tannic, definitely extended maceration. You guys should start playing around with saunier, as, as I was suggesting. Um, rosés made from saunier is really a a really popular thing they're kind of wine club wines if you don't want to make them a mass part market thing um it's nice to have it on premise people love to have a nice rosé in the afternoon and then you can concentrate the other wine make it more bold more tannic more all kinds of things um blend that back with stuff that you don't have as that is not as much contact time i think that you pretty much should attempt in some ways to try to measure some of these things i didn't get an opportunity I don't have enough time to really get it. If some of the things that are available for measurement, um, you guys, what what laboratories are out in, in Texas that will help you do analysis of analytics? I am not sure. ETS, I think, does something, but okay. other than that, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, ETS uh, has a profile for the wines that should be beneficial to you in terms of trying to get an idea about where you're at in terms of the extraction. I, I'm not that familiar with what methods they're using. I know that. Inartis also does uh, phenol profiling as well, and you can have a look at those kinds of data to sort of, you know, all, one thing that's nice about that, you can kind of look at all your wines after it's said and done from one year, you know, you made the one a certain way, maybe you could have each lot separate from each other still before you're blending. You can measure those things, taste them, get an idea about what the numbers kind of relate to when you're, from a sensory perspective. And to help you kind of guide you and kind of go after what you're looking for, you can also use it to sort of reverse engineer other wines you like. Um, you know, remembering to look at the alcohol, the titrated acidity, and the tannin and the color, because they all kind of go together as a package deal and the alcohol, of course, for your sensory profile. And that those things you can kind of keep in mind when you're when you're looking at all these numbers. So you can kind of reverse engineer things and kind of know, okay, I need more tannin, these are really low or um, or, or they are really high, and maybe I need to back off my extraction, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's helpful to have those numbers and not just the sensory portion of it. It's nice to connect the two to each other to help guide you. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. There's a question here How does soil pH affect tannins and anthocyanin creation? Um, you know, uh, in other plants, like in, I think, like uh, raspberries and things like that, uh, the soil pH has a huge effect on it. Um, I'm not really aware of any effects from soil pH on, in vinifera. I know that um, if you have a lot of potassium in the soil, that you, can, you can kind of goof up your, your titratable acidity pH uh, relationship in the wine. We've certainly seen in scenarios where they're really rich in potassium and things, you can get, and you, and you ripen the fruit for a long time, you can get both high pH and high TA. Do you guys get that occasionally? We do, you yeah. Like a PA of like 10 and a pH of like four um, and a half. More so in the hybrid. Um, you know, in the hybrids. Yeah. That's a, that's a lousy thing to have to deal with, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's you know, I, other than affecting the pH in the wine, which will definitely alter the, 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 sh the showiness of the color. So when you have lower pHs, more of the anthocyanins are in the charged form, which is the pigmented form. Um, that will that will definitely impact the, 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 the richness of that color in the wine, how, how much pink and red that you get. So, you know, maybe it's a little better to have a lower pH. It'll make the wines a little bit more stable for SO2 additions and things as well. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions at this point. So if you do have a question, please type it in now. Um, boom, 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 boom. 
Okay, Nicolaus, did you have a question? I, I noticed you raised your hand at some point. I'm not sure if you're still here or not, but if you are, let us know. What is the best temperature of fermentation for color extraction? <clears throat> well, you know, <laughs> that's a good question, but I, I, it's, it's an, an odd one. I think that you can kind of see from the, the, the extraction profile earlier I put up here that, you know, you don't really need cold. And these are all wine that we use under here. I mean, these are, you know, these big, pro, big fermentation wines. Uh, way back up again. Wow. Okay. This is peaking out, right? At four days. So some people will try to do a cold soak, like I was suggesting, where you are trying to enhance the anthocyanin extraction if you want to avoid tannin extraction later on. But you don't really need to do that. So I don't, I think that the tannin extraction or the anthocyanin extraction is going to happen regardless of whether you're cool or if you're warm. If you're really doing it to avoid tannin extraction, then yeah, you'll, you'll get, you won't get as much tannin extraction during a cold soak and you'll get just the pigments. But if you're, if you're a serious red wine maker and you're trying to make a tannic wine, it kind of defeats the purpose of it. So the pigments are going to happen extracted anyway. So it's, I don't think there's really an ideal concentration in that regard. There's another question from Adam. How does the use of oxygen during fermentation affect tannin anthocyanin development, especially when combined with extended maceration? Gotcha. That's a good question. So, um, you know, it's really hard to get oxygen into a fermentation. I know people try to do it. I think you can, you can, um, you can do it. You can do your own little experiment to see uh, um, how much oxygen you can get there. So. One of the things I often, you know, one of the things you can do it, it, with a, a lighter, actually, just walk up to a fermentation and um, try to see how close you can get the lighter before it goes out um, during an active ferment. And you'll, you won't will get very close because it'll put it out pretty quickly. And uh, basically, just due to the colligative properties of the system, you're super saturated with carbon dioxide. And that's going to basically prevent you from dissolving a lot of other gases in there. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do some of these things like, you know, pump overs where you're getting a lot of foam and all sorts of other things. Um, and we, we call it aeration. I know, uh, I mean, that I just, I've never been convinced that you're actually getting any actual oxygen in there just because there's so much other dissolved gas. I do like the results of when you do, where you're mixing it with liquid and not just doing punch downs. I like the, I like actually a combination of the two. Um, but I think that people want to see if you can get some of these acid aldehyde and things formed, you know, early on during the winemaking steps. And I don't, I don't know if it really happens. There's very low alcohol, of course, when you're doing that. And so there's less substrate to make acid aldehyde from. Um, but I think you get some neat effects on the wine instead that may or may not be related to that. You know, I, I actually like the result, but I think the, the wines are fruitier and all kinds of other things. And, I don't know what it does to the, the anthocyanin and tannin reactions. So for sure, if you're using oxygen during extended maceration, that's a wonderful way to get some of the, to sort of, in many ways, artificially age your wine early on. Um, uh, I didn't show it today, but I did an eight-month extended maceration trial with a student uh, a couple of years ago, and we're, we'll eventually publish that data. Uh, it's pretty cool what it does. It, it's a really... Um, uh, dramatic effect and it's really uh, it softens the tannin when you're doing some of those kinds of things like you're describing some of that oxygen i think it's really beneficial to the wine i think it's fun but you got to be careful you don't want to you don't want to um go too far but i think it's i think you could do some really neat stuff and not only that you're also kind of feeding the yeast to a certain extent and that's the other thing you got to kind of be mindful of in this scenario is that even if you can dissolve the oxygen in there if there's microbes they're going to be using it as well because the yeast love to use oxygen that they could use it to do a little aerobic respiration they love it i think they would get it well before the the tannins and the phenolics would get an opportunity to react with it we have two questions at this point what can you do in the vineyard to increase anthocyanins i guess that's a very oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Broad, um yeah. deficit irrigation if you're doing it um early uh, that means uh, after fruit set and prior to raisin if you apply a deficit irrigation that's a very effective way to get smaller berries and a bit more color into the wine. Um, that's pretty well established. 
Um, we actually have done, Dr. Dr. Marcus Keller, my, my uh, viticulture colleague over in Prosser, has done a lot of work on that. I helped him do quite a bit with the wine as well. Um, he's shown it plenty of times. I think that's probably the best way, personally. Um, especially if you guys are in Texas, it's probably one of the easier ways you can do it. Just make sure you water at the second half of the season. We've actually showed you can water back to pretty much full evaporative transpiration after raising, and that way you don't um, do too severe a deficit because you can really you can shrink the, the yield too much so that uh, you don't really see the benefits of everything because you've lost too much crop. But if you water back after a raisin, full evapotranspiration, you can maintain the crop and get nice small berries. It's pretty cool. How about the addition of stems for color extraction? By adding stems in fermentation, does it enhance anthocyanins and tannin? Um, you know, I haven't really, I think that you might be able to do that. There are, if you have really green stems, but the only worry I ever had about adding stems is stemmy flavor, right? If you're, if you're good with stemmy flavor and you like that thing in your wine, then you can get a bit of tannin from the stems in some cases when they're green and not like completely lignified and brown and, broke, and, and sort of hardened. You can get more tan extraction. I know that in Pinot Noir, they do that quite a bit down in Oregon and they, they see a boost in the tan extraction. And of course, a boost in the polymeric pigments due to that extra tannin. But be mindful that you're going to get stemmy flavoring. In fact, in Cabernet, there's more of those pyrazine compounds that cause veg, you know, the green bean and green pepper and asparagus flavors in the stems than there is in the berries themselves. So you're playing with fire if you're adding stems from Cabernet into your wine. I would, I would try to, I would, I would avoid that personally. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Herbertson, for a wonderful presentation, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. It's great to see you all here. We had people from Texas, of course, from all over the U.S. We had people from Canada, from Italy, New Zealand, Moldova, Italy, uh, I said Italy already, Greece, India, Portugal, France, and um, I think a few more countries as well. So thank you all. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all next time. If you want to take one minute to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you again and have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Harbertson. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.